Okay, we're back live here in uh, Silicon Valley, California. This is SiliconAngle.tv, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. This is a special broadcast at Brocade's headquarters uh, in California, at the Brocade Technology Analyst Day. And uh, we're here with Ro Rob Vitsky and Stu Miniman with Wikibon. Uh, Rob, welcome to uh, the Cube. You're with Internet 2, so you, you know a little bit about the internet and uh, going back in terms of all the challenges of interconnection now evolved to a fully connected world. Absolutely. And uh, so one, first question I have for you is, um, how does Brocade fit into all this future uh, networking? Obviously Ethernet is now uh, being the preferred platform extending out over the years. So give us your update on Internet 2 and, and why Brocade today? Sure, so Internet 2 was formed by leading re research universities in 1996 to make sure there was always a sandbox for the next generation of the Internet. And you know, what we've been really focusing on in the last year or so is how to introduce massive amounts of bandwidth, bandwidth abundance again, and take advantage of innovations like SDN um, to reopen the network for innovation, to re re rethink about the way applications interact with the network, um, and how bandwidth can, can uh, allow applications to do new and creative things. Brocade's part of that story um, in the new national innovation platform we're building. We're building a national layer two network, 100 gig backbone, SDN enabled between about 30 locations across the country. Brocade's one of the key partners in providing the technology for that. I wrote a, I guess it wasn't really a blog post back in the day, but back in 2001 we were doing some work around uh, you know, pre-Wi-Fi, you know, long range uh, wireless, uh, which ended up becoming WiMAX and now Wi-Fi, called Broadband Starvation was the name of the web post, if you will. Talking about the freedom of what internet can provide to people. Obviously, you know, more broadband, more freedom. So we're back to an era where, you know, today the iPhone was long, iPhone 5 was introduced, and right. you know, one of the big features was LTE, which is basically like, okay, more bandwidth, Absolutely. right? So, so obviously, bandwidth equals freedom, bandwidth equals education, bandwidth equals a lot of good things. So, so that being said, um, what's your perspective around this new modern era of networking and software infrastructure? Because now the networking is converging with virtual machines. You mentioned sandbox that implies developers and or innovation. So share with us your view of software infrastructure. Why is software playing such a big role and why is SDN so, so hot right now? So I think you know, one of the things we've been thinking about is we've introduced this new eight terabit national network with 100 gig waves on it, um, is you know, the eras of innovation where, where things really changed and moved quickly are eras where we had um, two things happening really. We had abundance of bandwidth as opposed to bandwidth scarcity. Um, and we had folks who were able to innovate. My boss tells a story about um, on a Friday afternoon, someone said to one of his engineers, you'll never get IP to work over, or video to work over IP. Um, and that guy came back in on a Monday morning with a set of code, loaded it into the network stack, um, and showed them the prototype of uh, video over IP. You know, we haven't had the ability to do that kind of innovation with massive bandwidth in a long time because the network stack has closed up. Um, so for us, this inflection point of SDN and 100 gigabit kind of reopens the opportunity for innovation in a way we haven't seen in a long time. What cutting edge things can you point to right now that's really a leading trend that you can say, this is an example of what could happen in the next decade? So I think you, you touched on it, you know, clearly virtualization of um, computing clusters and a much tighter integration of the network with storage and compute and visualization are something that um, has already made a huge difference and will continue uh, to do so, the, the Higgs boson that was announced just a couple weeks ago um, as the discovery in the physics community is the result of a massive parallel grid computing system run over networks like Internet 2, and also building on innovations like the Mosaic browser that was innovated um, and created by those guys at NCSA to visualize physics data out of CERN a generation ago. Um, so, you know, I think those kind of innovations are exactly what we're about, and you know, again, we're, we're, we see SDN as a gateway to that. So given, let me ask a little philosophical question. Obviously in the academic community where you guys have, have been a key, key part of connecting the key institutions that are doing high-end uh, uh, research, 
computing power, HPC, high performance computing, has always been in the academic world. From looking at curing cancer to right. you know, oil and gas simulations, a lot of simulation type, high end computing. But now you've got network bandwidth. What kind of effect does that mean for creativity and developers? Um, well, so I think, I think you know, one of the things that we're going to see, and just to follow on that story about um, you know, the academic community being the only place where high performance computing and high bandwidth is available, I think you know, we, we saw an example of a gene sequencer that fits in the palm of your hand um, that would allow you to pump out huge amounts of data on a personal basis, one-time use gene sequencer. Those kinds of things are going to be on networks, and it's going to force application developers to think about how to transport that data, how to store it, how to sort it, how to authenticate it, um, in a way they never have to had to, to deal with, in the scale they've never had to deal with before. Um, and so, you know, you come back to what does it mean to the network folks? Well, you know, we need we need the network to just be an extension of that application solution set, as opposed to be a black box that's set apart into the side of those applications. Yeah, with good comes the ugly, right? So let's go to the uh, the dark side and talk about uh, when you have abundance of bandwidth and abundance <laughs> of high performance computing, the bad guys can compute passwords and now you have open, open security challenges. Yeah, so absolutely. how are you guys looking at that and saying, okay, you know, maybe, networks, may, maybe network virtualization can be a solution for security. You know, by bounding the platform, we, we were talking with Brocade about their ASIC strategy, so you got all kinds of new innovations around kind of things happening at the network all the way through the application. How do you guys look at the bad guys now? Because there's obviously there's some stuff going on, on the dark side as well. Yeah. Well, so one of, the, one of the things I should say is, you know, Internet 2 is the platform for these innovations. The campuses and the researchers and the corporate partners are the ones who are actually inventing this stuff. I think it's probably true that we've had an aha moment in the last year or two where folks have said, boy, this SDN thing could really change things. It's a new paradigm to think about networks. I'm not sure we've had an aha moment in the security space yet. <laughs> Where we've well, maybe said, aha, this is a real deal, we got to get used to it, it's yeah, bad. And, you know, and, and so one of two <laughs> things happen is we have a catastrophic event or someone comes up with a new paradigm and hopefully um, you know, these networks and the new capabilities we have will be a, a place where they can actually innovate and create a solution to that new paradigm. All right, so, so, so Rob, if I could focus on the tech for a second yeah. here, you know, you know, talk about the networking gear. Most of the customers I talk to, and even the service providers, are still going through that one to 10 gigabit Absolutely. transition. Yep. You guys are doing 100 gig. Yep. Pricing is, I mean, to be honest, very expensive at this point, and there, there's research to go beyond. I mean, we were talking off camera beforehand about things like terabit ethernet. Absolutely. I remember three, four years ago, I went to you know, an ethernet summit, and you know, they were saying, you know, there's 10 companies in the world that need terabit ethernet now. It's you know, Google, Facebook, you know, some of the internet guys, kind of like yourself. So right. can you lay out for us, you know, what do you see as, as a user of 100 gig? You know, how, you know, what's the maturity level? What are the biggest challenges you have? And you know, how, I mean, we always need more bandwidth, right. but how fast is it driving in your environment and, and, and what are you seeing in that space? So you know, we're in this really lucky position. We're the tip of the spear yeah. and we are, you know, our network serves a pre-market space where you know, folks can try things out. Um, you know, the maturity of the 100 gig gear is really good. Um, the 100 gig transponders that are on our optical network seem to be rock solid. Um, the 100 gig ports that are on several different vendors that we're using in our network seem to be rock solid. Um, and in terms of you know, supporting big flows across 100 gig interfaces, it seems to work. Um, so I think you know, that all works out. On the commercial side, you asked the question about pricing. Yeah. Um, you know, again, we're, we have the luxury of serving a very small community um, and you know, focusing on hundreds of ports, not thousands or millions. Um, and so you know, we're being aggressive about pushing 100 gig ports out and making them uh, as available as 10 gig ports um, so that folks will get on early adopters. But that's really the space we're in trying to encourage that. Okay, and you starting to look forward past the 100 gig. You know, wh where, wh where do you see that today? So one of the things we've done in the last year or so is we've acquired um, a, a dark fiber capability with our own optical kit. Um, and absolutely, you know, whether it's 200, 400, or terabit capabilities, um, we already have folks who are saying that they'd like to be able to have terabit capabilities within two years. One of our major partners in building this network, the Department of Energy's ESnet that connects all the national uh, labs, um, is clearly looking at terabit within a short period of time. Yeah. Um, any interaction with, you know, talk about broadband, what's going on in the marketplace. Google made quite a big splash recently. Yeah. Um, you, you guys play in that space at all, or, you know, what, what, what's the relationship? So there? there's some real synergies between the research and education community, which, you know, typically is the tip of the spear in terms of new deployments of broadband technology. You think about Ethernet in the dorm rooms being hundreds of thousands of ports of Ethernet um, in a time where dial-up was commonplace in the home. Um, you know, the same thing is true today with next generation SDN, 10 gig 
um, and 100 gig technologies and wireless too. Um, there are communities like Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, the Utopia Project in Utah that are thinking about how they leverage uh, bandwidth abundance and think about technologies like SDN to introduce network innovation in communities. Um, and clearly what Google's doing is a piece of that as well. Um, there's a project uh, sponsored by the White House called US Ignite, um, which actually has a, a program to incent applications development in communities related to SDN technologies. And the Mozilla Foundation and US Ignite are, are doing a lot of work in that space. So there's always a big conversation around net neutrality, obviously, um, and getting broadband. I mean, everyone wants broadband in every home at the highest speeds. There's always a talk of the U.S. not as competitive as some other nations, right. um, which we need to work on, and that's certainly that. But the balance between private and public um, funding and or deployment has been a big challenge, hence the Google Fiber Project, you know, which I think is just a, a policy gambit to kind of force the existing incumbents to move faster. Um, because again, Google makes more money if there's faster bandwidth, because right. more clicks per second in their ads than, than ever before, and obviously with video and everything else. So, so where are we on the spectrum of success? I mean, obviously, you got Comcast, you got Verizon, you got the telcos. You know, we've seen the battleground of Celex back in the day. We saw what happening, was happening with wireless, and today it's even amplified even further with Verizon, LTE, and AT&T, and now the iPhone 5 supporting LTE, LTE. It's obviously good that it's going that way, but those guys still got to run their base stations and connect to some backhaul. So, so there's all this stuff going on. So sort out for the people out there, where are we with national, meaning not government, but just overall in our country, where are we with broadband, broadband penetration, and then how much work, what are the key work areas we have to do there? So I, I think, I think you know, you would, the only thing you can say about the U.S. is it's uneven. <laughs> um, and the story I tell is I have a little off-grid cabin that's solar powered in southern Vermont. Um, where I'm going to have fiber to the cabin based on a uh, stimulus grant project that Vermont Telephone has received. Congratulations. Whereas my uh, home in a um, fairly urban setting in West Hartford, Connecticut, uh, my choices are cable modem or DSL. Yeah, and you're far from the CO, I can imagine, probably. And I'm just blocks from the <laughs> CO, right? Um, so I think it's very uneven. And you look at other countries that are making major investments um, to bring fiber to the home across their country. They're going to have, a, they're going to have an advantage um, to some extent. Um, I think, I think you know, there is an enormous amount of funding in the U.S. that goes towards broadband development through things like the Universal Service Fund, rural telehealth, and the other rural things. stuff, and the um, farm bill, and, and you know, we've whatnot. got, we've got to, yeah, and through Russ, exactly, we've got to do a much better job of setting a higher standard so that those dollars aren't spent on spent on old technology. So, is wireless a way to do that? I mean, you know, obviously, there's all kinds of frequency issues, and the Spectrum Map has been a big FCC thing. I mean, right. is it is it going to be wireless? Is the answer going to be? Uh, wireless to get to the homes, given that you know, to trench and to dig and to you know, provision you know, fiber. It's challenging, I mean, you, like you said, you've got DSL and you're, you're essentially handicapped at that point. Right. Um, so and I, that's, that's a U.S. phenomenon. I, I've always been a fan of the infrastructure in the ground um, and yeah. you know, I've always thought that the fiber was the right long-term strategy. The, the wireless guys are coming along though, and you know, the technologies and the LTE are certainly better than I think any of us would have expected Clear a few wire, years that's ago. Clear wire, that didn't do too well, I mean. No, but so. you know, the, the performance you get on your iPad when you're walking around in an airport um, is often acceptable. Yeah, it's yeah. not as good as it should be. Um, but you know, I, I still think that you know, we've got to do a better job setting standards and policies that encourage um, investment in wired, wired networks to the home. Yeah, well I'm a libertarian in this area. I mean, I've, I've written many times about the fact that we need to have essentially roads um, paved, if you will, in fiber uh, into all the different communities. But you know, a lot of the communities just can't handle the administrative piece. We saw that with the ISP market. I live in Palo Alto, California. They tried fiber. It's just, it, <laughs> It can be challenging. Absolutely. Um, is it simply an economic issue, or is it, it or is well, it more I, of uh, just no one can do it? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a capability or a technology issue. If that's the question, I think there's just a, you know a bunch of um, a, a bunch of incumbent interests that are you know uh, have very real constraints on what they can do, yeah. um, and we haven't broke through. It's another one of these aha moments. When's the aha moment going to come about how you do it differently and make it happen? Yeah. So, so Rob, any commentary on the education system and how we're doing it, really getting the internet to, to the school systems out there? I saw you've got a background at UConn. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, go Huskies. So, uh, <laughs> you know, w where do we stand? And what, what, what do you, I mean, education obviously is such a huge challenge for the U.S. Right. Um, you know, 
what, what do we need to do? Well, I think, I think you know, the U.S. still has an incredible education system um, and you know, we have a lot of opportunities to transform that. Internet 2 is focused on you know, really three factors in terms of what we do to service that community. Um, uh, creating platforms for innovation, uh, enabling transformation, and things like these massively online courses um, and helping U.S. institutions be leaders in providing those. Um, and then also building the community of folks that will adopt and um, continue to expand and improve those technologies. Um, I think, I think you know, we're doing okay, um, but we could do a lot better. And you, know, you look at what happened at Virginia Tech with the, um, the change in leadership there and then the change back in leadership um, a, a few months, sorry, University of Virginia, um, a few months ago. Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges in the Higher Education Academy and um, we've got a lot of work to do. In terms of broadband, you know, there has been a $3.4 billion investment through the stimulus package in broadband networks. Again, extremely uneven in terms of what states invested where, but um, there's a massive amount of fiber being run to community anchors, institutions, schools, libraries, health clinics, um, and related government organizations. Um, and so, you know, we're making some progress there, very uneven, but um, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I think also too, you know, my experience in, in you know, I've been, I've been a champion for broadband, spent a lot of my time, passion, trying to get wireless deployments uh, with a lot of failure under my belt and as well, a lot of my colleagues. Um, there's a huge frustration around the grant process and all the work that's required to get the dollars yeah. when speed is, is the issue, right? So that's one, one issue. So comment on that, and then two, just comment on your vision of the future. What's next for Internet 2, and how are you guys going to take the success you've done academically and in communities and try to get that more mainstream? Yeah, well, so I think it's, it's true that some of the grant processes, both for you know, commercial providers and for the educational um, institutions could be streamlined and sometimes they focus on the wrong outcomes. Um, they're more based on processing inputs than on the outcomes yeah. that they're trying to achieve. Um, in terms of what's next for Internet 2, you know, this is a really exciting time. Um, you know, the, the investments we have in this new national infrastructure, massive amounts of capability, um, the opportunities that things like SDN present, transformation that's happening through things like massively online courses, move to cloud service providers, and transformation of the IT infrastructure within the universities. All are opportunities, um, and it's an extremely exciting time. You, know, you hear in the valley here, folks say, it's fun to be in networking again. Um, I think that's very true about the innovation space where Internet 2 lives, too, that it's a really great time to be part of this community. So, exactly, and, you know, networking, we're talking with uh, Jay Shree from Arista, she raised money for a company when networking was kind of like not sexy, now you got Nasira being sold for a billion dollars. It's great, and then with the wireless exploding, I mean, now if you think about what we're doing with our mobile phones, even a decade ago, it's like, okay, Wi-Fi, and you had essentially not even, you know, a lot of, not a lot of data over the wire, and then obviously you're seeing that advance. The, you know, the question is, where is the infrastructure, you know, used to be points of presence, used to be kind of like, you know, the, the big discussion, now you got Metro Pops, now you have a lot of, uh, you know, backhaul type high performance, but yet at the last mile or the edge, it's still creeping along. What do you expect to have happen in the next decade? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think, that unless we get our act together in terms of changing the investment policy um, and you know, get folks focused on, on uniform networks, we're going to see a lot more unevenness like we see today. But I think you're going to see the result of some of the recent projects. Um, you're going to see examples of really great connectivity and really great broadband. And it will be hard for other communities and other folks not to follow and try and do the same thing. Well, Brocade's got some really good solutions for simplifying in the fabric, the provisioning, and making all the dynamic north, south, east, west stuff happen more effectively. Hopefully that'll streamline the app process okay. and get the funding in. Uh, Rob uh, Vitsky from Internet2, thanks for joining theCUBE. Thank you. This is SiliconAngle.tv special edition here at Brocade headquarters for Brocade Tech Analyst Day. I'm John Furrier, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>